are listening to Red Eyes Radio. We are coming to you from Sweden in Scandinavia. My name is Henrik and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Today we are talking about the megalithic sites of New England with Hugh Newman, who is a Earth Mysteries and Esoteric Science researcher. He organizes the Megalithomania conferences, he co-edits Avalon Rising magazine and coordinates talks, films and workshops at numerous festivals. He has researched the indigo child phenomenon and published a book on the subject. His most recent book, Earth Grids, has been published by Wooden Books. He is an honorary member of the Antiquarian Society and has spoken at conferences in the UK, Malta, France, Peru and North America. And usually you might not think about North America when megaliths are discussed, but as Barry Fell and others have shown, they do have their fair share of them over there as well. It is a worldwide phenomenon. And today we are going to talk about Mystery Hill, America's Stonehenge, the hill that roars, Poverty Point, and many, many other places as well. So stay with us. Welcome back to Red Eyes Radio, Hugh Newman. It is great to talk to you once again. How are you today, Hugh? I'm, I'm great, thanks, Henrik. How are you? I am excellent. Good to talk to you. And uh, we have uh, quite a bit of fascinating topics here that we want to cover today. Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about New England here. Uh, in the beginning, uh, interesting place, interesting area. We were talking uh, off the record a little bit here, obviously, about some of the things that are scattered over the whole east coast of the of the United States. But uh, why don't we just discuss a little bit of, first? You have a few. You have a conference coming up in New England, uh, Megalithomania. You 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 placed it here, obviously, and and so this ties in nicely in with the the upcoming conference, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons we, we chose that site, n- number one, because it's called Glastonbury in Connecticut, and we always do Glastonbury in England, so we thought we'd uh, follow the Glastonbury energies across the Atlantic. Um, and secondly, because of all the incredible sites that are very close to that particular area in New England, um, I mean, there's literally, I mean, there's probably thousands, but there's been hundreds, hundreds of them recorded, these megalithic chambers, monoliths, standing stones, uh, even stone circles now. Um, lots of strange energies and archaeoastronomy associated with them. And, um, and I'm fascinated because it's kind of, you know, there's so many European connections with that northern part of America. It kind of blows me away. So we decided to just do the conference there my friend Jason Matoso he kind of is helping set it up We're doing it on the 21st to the 23rd of October um, <clears throat> 2011 Glastonbury Connecticut and we've got you know some, obviously some top speakers John Major Jenkins Freddie Silver Beth Hargens and, and many others mm-hmm. uh, and we're going to do three days of tours so if people I mean that's the main reason we're really doing it is, is for the tours to get, get people out into that particular part of the world because even a lot of people in America I mean, as you probably know just um aren't aware of the amazing sites that are there. I mean, it's just, it is one of the most amazing megalithic prehistoric landscapes in North America. Um, but it's just not really known about. It's very few people kind of, it doesn't really get out there as much as it should. So uh, I got so excited when I was there back in um, uh, 2008 that um, I kind of have to, had to go back there this year. So. <laughs> well, it's right. It's, uh, it's, it's a history that is covered up for many different reasons, uh, just as certain ones seems to be here here, over in Europe as well but New England then specifically we're we're talking about obviously the the north uh, the northeast the tip north of of the uh, the United States and uh, uh, do you think that they might have called it this for a reason then uh, considering the the stone circle connections and all that what do you think well, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the name names up there, like New York, even and New England, it's all just um, you know rehashing kind of English kind of names as such. Um, but I mean, just I should point out that New York State has quite a lot of these megaliths as well. Uh, specifically, the Dolmens uh, is, is a huge one, um, Balanced Rock in uh, nor- northern uh, in New York State, not far, only about an hour from New York, in fact, north of there. Um, but there's a lot of connections um, with English names, place names out there. That, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole list of them you could just sort of go into New Jersey is another one obviously yeah. um, um, but there's, there's a lot of you know when you start looking into the sort of more alternative history of that area you realise there were connections with Europe and it, it looks like there's evidence now of prehistoric connections between uh, New England and Britain and Ireland and other parts of Europe um, there's a brilliant guy called Barry Fell who wrote America BC, you know, about 20 or so years ago. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, he did some absolutely superb research um, on that area, and he got ridiculed hugely by the academics, by the historians. They even had, you know, um, TV programs 
just to dismiss and destroy his reputation. Uh, but he stood up for himself, you know, respectfully, and kind of um, and now people are realising how important his initial work was, and he actually broke down the barriers of academia to get to get um, ancient America noticed. Uh, it's a bit like it's the same kind of story you get with Alexander Tom in England, I guess, um, where you get the same kind of prejudice and you know just it's completely disrespecting them even though they, they haven't looked at his their research properly yeah. and so thank god for people like Barry Fell and others who have kind of you know trailblazed through there and actually opened opened the doors up for all the other researchers who've um, who are working in that part of the world absolutely uh, i think if we if we even go a little further north up from from new england and and going to the newfoundland uh, there's far back estimated as about 1000 um CE common era uh, there was the the Vikings heading over to to Vinland or Va- Wineland they call it actually mm-hmm. Vinland uh, so I think that there's been waves of, of different peoples heading over to the American continent and obviously by default you have people already there as well obviously but who do you think is behind uh, some of the monuments in in, uh, in New England uh, Hugh? Well, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, I mean, what maybe I should do first is just describe the monuments because there's there's lots of different ones. I mean, I haven't looked at them all yet. That's one of the reasons I want to go back there. Um, but when I was back there in 2008, the first place we went were, were the sites around Vermont. Uh, the first place I went to was a, a site called Calend One, and this kind of interested me because it's a whole complex spread over you know possibly a few miles. And um, in the groundbreaking book called Manitou, The Sacred Landscape of New England's Native Civilization, which came out in 1989 uh, by Byron E. Dix and James W. Maver, they kind of did a proper astroarchaeological examination of the whole landscape around there. And, um, and, and, and some of the stuff they came up with was absolutely superb. I mean, there was even um, some dating, some carbon dating of some of the layers around some of the chambers there, which went back to 8000 BC. <laughs> Now, whether whether there was just a previous, you know, occupation there, or whether it was actually, um, you know, they were using it as an astronomical site back then is unknown. But I think, I think their kind of research based it upon, uh, based upon the Alexander Tom's research. Really, they kind of dated it to like possibly either a few hundred to a thousand or two thousand BC at the most. But there's varying varying sort of ways to look at it you see um they certainly had they were certainly using the sun and moon cycles there's evidence of the 18.6 year lunar cycle um in in the layout of the stones around the greater landscape and the valleys they were in uh and they observed it actually as though they were sitting in the chamber these sort of mega small megalithic chambers with great big blocks over the top like these lintels they would like sit at the back of it and when they when they looked out of the doorway of the chamber that's where they would see the sunrise or sunset or the stars moving across or the, the moon moving across at different times of year hmm. um, and, and that seems to be um, how they were working with it according to um, the authors of that brilliant book Manitou but I mean that's just Vermont I mean there's also Calendar 2 in Vermont which is a much huge chamber we didn't get a chance to visit it last time because Many of the many of the sites in New England are actually on private land, um, um, and they're generally classed. You get this almost everywhere in New England. Um, they're generally classed as colonial root cellars, um, where the colonialist first settlers over there would actually build. They claim build megalithic chambers to keep their potatoes and okay. vegetables. <laughs> which is, it was kind of odd, and that's kind of been pretty much disproved. Um, but still, even archaeologists and, and academics over there still say that. Um, and so what happens is, this is one of the big problems uh, in New England, really. I mean, this is what near the New England Antiquities Research Association have been campaigning against for years now, is the fact that because they're, they're partly they're on private land, and partly they're not recognised as megalithic or ancient, you know, prehistoric sites that should be revered by us, really, and looked after and protected. Mm. So they get they get damaged, they get destroyed, they get used by whoever for anything. Um, road widening schemes, uh, construction projects, it's all happening there. And you know, and so a lot of these chambers get destroyed, and a lot of these whole sacred landscapes just get completely eaten up. 
and it's partly the archaeologist's fault. This has to be said, I think. This has yeah. to be sort of out there because, <laughs> you know, they do a lot of great work over there, the archaeologists. I'm, I'm not dissing them completely, but there really, there really needs to be another level of uh, understanding of these particular chambers because if people like myself and, and the people from NERA, this group who protect these sites and look after them and guide people around them, um, it's, you know, we're, 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 we're not professional archaeologists. We're kind of alternative or independent researchers who just have a passion for it. We're like antiquarians, lovers of old things, uh, or megalithomaniacs, whatever you want to call us. Um, but, you know, I think, but we can't, we can't, we don't have the clout to stop construction projects or road widening schemes, uh, and things like this. And yeah. this is something I came across when I was there in 2008. It's something that a guy called Dan Budillion, who does a lot of, um, research around the Shobra and um, around the sort of Boston area has been challenging um, quite a lot so there's a lot to consider when you, when you start kind of discovering and researching these sites more than just the prehistoric nature of them So do you think, uh, in other words, there's a cover story that they put up uh, in terms of the, the colonizers coming over there in the, in the, the last wave, if you will, uh, building these, these uh, dolmens and these underground uh, uh, basically cavities, but they were there from before that time. That's what you're saying uh, here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think they were there. You know, there's stories I've heard uh, in through my various research, and mainly through the people at Nera, um, is that they a lot of them are prehistoric. I mean, there's evidence that America's there's a place called America's Stonehenge, which is Mystery Hill up in New Hampshire, uh, which I visited um, last time I was there, and, and that's a you know some of the stones up there and the chambers and the megaliths are awesome um absolutely huge and it just it just doesn't seem like that, that you know it just doesn't seem like local as such and i've heard reports as well in some of the books that i was researching uh, and through nera that many of the, the native americans there didn't actually know who built them they just came across them themselves mm -hmm. um, and so you know that gives another element to it well who did make them then you know that, that, that's that's kind of a standard story if you will Hugh a lot of the the latest uh, you know accounts that we have from from the indigenous people often comes down to that point that they say oh, we we didn't build it we just kind of you know moved in here if you will <laughs> but they they don't know they they can't tell who actually built it that's pretty interesting yeah i mean and well i mean the carbon dating at mystery hill is really interesting as well there's been some um there's research down there which puts it back to 2000 bc up to 200 ad uh, and this is ca proper carbon dating uh, because they, they, it's basically been turned into like a more touristy site now and you get school buses turn up there and hundreds of tourists come, come and see it's one of the only sites they've actually done that to in New England so mm -hmm. in, in a way it's kind of preserved it and, and protected it but in another way it does get a little bit damaged to all the tourists but at least it's starting to put you know that, that part of the country back on the map Is, is there any evidence as far as you know Hugh about uh major cities, uh, places that have grown into large cities in New England today, or, or larger towns, if you will, but actually were uh, an important site uh, from the ancient world, meaning again we're back to that idea that a church or other types of, of buildings might simply have just covered over a, a an indigenous, religious uh, you know, megalithic site, basically. It's, it's quite possible, I'm sure. Some, I mean, there's so many sites around New York and around Boston, for instance, uh, very close to the, you know, the main part of the city. But um, that I would imagine that has been the case. I don't have any direct evidence to suggest that. Um, but certainly, if you go around the outskirts of Boston uh, in all directions, really, you, you find um, you do find these megalithic kind of complexes. Um, there's, a, there's a perch boulder up on the Boston, near the Boston coast, for instance which we're going to have a look at this time when we go over there. And obviously, America's Stonehenge isn't too far north of there, in New Hampshire. That's up uh, in, uh, in Salem, uh, right? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, North Salem, New Hampshire. Yeah, that's the one. Mm. And uh, there's a lot of places called Salem in that part of the country. <laughs> it gets a little bit confusing. <laughs> I see, I see, yeah. Because you, you have North Salem in New York State as well, which is you know, 100, 200 miles away. Uh, which is where the Balanced Rock is, which is the huge, the biggest, one of the biggest dolmens I've ever seen. Um, and it's absolutely a really impressive sight to see, and it's got tons of energy anomalies. Um, orbs have been photographed there, there's been ghostly sightings at, at that place, and, and at many others of these sites. Um, and so, yeah, they're in surprising places. I mean, you wouldn't think 
you know, New York State or uh, New England would be a particularly, you know, impressive megalithic area. But once you get to know it and you get to find out about these sites, it's, it's, it's quite unbelievable. It's more the evidence is accumulating uh, towards the basic premise that these megalithic sites are all over the world. It's basically just because human beings haven't, uh, you know, he- headed off from the from the town, from the city, and and uh, actually, you know, researched or, or looked into it alone. Uh, they, they don't know what's around them. They don't know what's there. They don't know their own history, if you will. It, it's kind of sad, but but at the same time, what it shows is that these things are are all over just as long as you know there might be a few people knowing about them but they don't generally maybe set up a website about it they might be maybe not even talk with other people about it so the knowledge in some regards is there but it's not widely known if i put it that way here yeah yeah i mean this is one of the reasons people like um there's a guy called andy burnham who runs megalithic.co.uk or the megalithic portal and he encourages people from all different parts of the world to actually He's actually got, got it sort of designed within itself, so you just upload your pictures, your... That's, cool. that's right. That's an excellent source, by the way, an excellent uh, website for people to kind of report uh, on their own findings, right? Yeah, and, and he's, what he's found is that he's got sort of... Really, he's got just enthusiasts from really random places and around the world who are just, you know, recording everything in their area, which have never been put out there before. Um, and so I think I think the internet is obviously helping hugely with actually awareness and protecting a lot of these sites now. Um, and so yeah, it's got a lot to say. There's another website where you can upload stuff to called themodernantiquarian.com, which was set up originally by Julian Cope, um, based upon his, his two books. And so I think it's really important that people start doing that in their local area. Um, I think with, it's so easy to just construction projects and housing and things like that just to move in with just money on the mind um, and convenience on the mind and without any awareness of what our ancestors were doing on that particular part of the landscape the fact they might even be buried there that's um, right if, and if, if people don't know what they're looking at or, 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 or for the, then chances are people will just uh, you know destroy it basically yeah, absolutely, and this is kind of the nature of you know capitalist society, um, and it's happening kind of on a global scale. There's a lot of sites that are under threat. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a global phenomenon at the moment. How many are under threat? But um, luckily, you know, a lot of, a lot of the times the archaeologists get a chance to get in there and actually find out what's going on, or groups manage to sort of protect them by petitions and things like that. I mean, there was the whole Tara incident up in Ireland where they've actually managed to stop some of it, I believe. Whereas a lot of it's still happening mm. um, but the thing in New England is that you know a lot of these sites especially in New York State and, and around um, uh, some of the sites in Massachusetts one of, one of some of the ones I looked at is that they're actually on the side of the road they're actually on highways they're actually these chambers are like 10 feet away often you know 5 feet away from the edge of the road so if they're doing road widening schemes they're going to be destroyed unless they're recognised and protected um, I find that quite odd. The more I looked, the more you, you notice how many of them are next to the main road. Um, well, that particular wasn't, area. wasn't this the case, Hugh, with the with the, the the new road going through very close to Stonehenge as well, the A4 or whatever it's called? It was like uh, actually the parking lot there now actually goes over a, a previous kind of s- uh, smaller circle. I think there was some controversy there. Do yes. you recall that story? Yeah, well, the, the parking lot, where you know, there's three big blobs of paint, circular blobs of paint in a line. Uh, where actually the oldest known part of Stonehenge actually existed, uh, and it was three great wooden posts that dated to um, about ten thousand years ago, um, which is longer than it's before the time when the first stones or the henge were, were starting to be built. A lot, mm-hmm. lot, longer, mm-hmm. lot, lot, lot longer before that. But, and so the most ancient part of that has been just about now a car park with three painted blobs in it, which is quite depressing. But what it does show, though, is um, that, you know, what interests me is the fact that them three posts were put there so long ago. And it's interesting how, you know, over hundreds of generations later, um, they then build Stonehenge right next to it and all the mounds and all the curses and all the other stuff right next to it as though it was a specific geodetic site mm. which I find really interesting there was this whole thing they were going to do recently where they wanted to 
um, sort of just remove one of the roads and build something underground or something like this but I think that got stopped actually but I mean with with Stonehenge the road is quite away from the stones themselves there is one stone which is next to the road but that's got a fence around it still so it's not I mean in New England they're, so, they're quite small some of these chambers they're, they're, you, you call them mini lithic or medium mini lithic or something like that <laughs> Right. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the sites are called lithic sites which just means stone in New England so they're yeah. not that big but some of them are pretty big and they've got big lintel stones across the top and you have all these, these strange magnetite this iron ore that goes through it and you get these amazing magnetic readings from them as well um, which is something we can talk about you know in the first hour uh, some of the tests that have been done on, on some of these sites but yeah it just seems like this like say the, the road widening construction projects are putting a lot of these sites under threat and it's something I'm quite passionate about is to you know try and protect them somehow absolutely uh, preserve a, at least the memory and the knowledge of where they were and how they looked and, and what not before they potentially are, are destroyed by development projects but um, if we go back to uh, Massachusetts again then Hugh and talk there's a, an interesting site I was looking into that before we talked here called uh, the Nashoba Hill or, or the Hill That Roars T tell us about that one a little bit that's right. This is this is a very strange place. This is I went there with Dan Budillion, and that's um, I think it's slightly west of Boston, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, and there's some chambers around there as well, which are very interesting. Uh, they've got very powerful energies involved in them. Just the chambers themselves. I mean, I'll just better say this now. Most of the chambers I went to personally, because I, I do a bit of dowsing and sort of geomancy kind of stuff when I go there, they all had interesting magnetic effects. They all had. Um, uh, major earth energy currents going through them into the chamber uh, often crossing just outside the front of them and they had these interesting telluric energies these telluric lines which are part of the earth's magnetic field that break up into these telluric currents that always seemed to bounce around in a zigzag within these sites and they were particularly strong around the Shoba Hill and up on the top there of this actual hill it's almost like a mountain um, there's this there's been these stories that it makes this roaring sound it goes back hundreds of years to when the first settlers were there it's even part of the Native American tradition of that area as well um, and if people want to want to check out more about it they can go to Dan Budillion's website uh, it's danbudillion.com or .net um, and they can actually sort of, he's done a whole research project on that particular area right we went up there with Dan uh, we were there in 2008 with our friend Glenn Broughton who's also a researcher and right on the top of the hill there's this like this crystal megalith just sitting there it's quite small it's only you know, you could, you know it's as far as your hands can stretch either way kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, but there's it's just it's just sitting there and it's like it just it shouldn't have been there it wasn't part of the geology it, it, it's like someone had placed it there in ancient times as part of their kind of ritual significance of that hill and and the, the great lake uh, which is near Neshoba there's been very strange light phenomenon happened over that as well it's almost like a dome of light has appeared over that and it's something that Dan Brodillion's actually seen himself and he's got no idea what that's about how it could form even um, and, um, and and that goes back into you know pre-colonial um, times as well where people have recorded similar light phenomenon in that particular area it's almost like I think it's some geomagnetic and geological fault area mm. uh, which is possibly causing this but there's been a lot of magical things happen around there as well according to Dan and others so yes yeah, particularly interesting place to visit I mean there's, there's not a great deal to see there from a megalithic perspective but energetically wise there's definitely something going on there Do you know if uh, Budilion has, has uh, managed to, to, to record or ha has he heard the, the, the noise the sound himself? I don't know if he's heard it himself, but he's heard a, a lot of reports of it mm -hmm. that go back a few hundred years. But um, I don't know, they've, they've kind of built on it now a little bit, this hill. It's like a sort of ski resort there and things like that where there's a fake, one of them fake ski slopes. So I think that's kind of ruined slightly. Mm -hmm. yeah. most, of it's still, most of it's still countryside and you can still kind of um, check it all out. So there's still quite a bit to see there. Interesting. Um uh, if we if we move on, I guess from there, there there's just as you pointed out, you obviously so many different sites we don't think about. Uh, Rhode Island, how about how about that? Yeah, Rhode Island. Yeah, that's where the, I went to a conference there by NERA, the New England Antiquities Research Association, and they did a fascinating event there. And they, we went to a lot of the sites around that particular area. Um, you get these the strange Newport Tower there, which is very interesting. Um, it, lo it's, it looks they think it might be Viking, or it could be. Um, Venetian, they just got no idea who built it. There's actually a second one 
was recently discovered in that area as well, which I think was either on private land or people just, just ignored it, <laughs> didn't notice it till recently, <laughs> and now it suddenly got out into Nero and, and, the, and the press in that area. So, and, and these they seem to be like, they seem to be like lookout towers. Um, but right where they are, they sort of come in on this kind of estuary, kind of from the sea. Um, on the old maps, on the old Mercator maps and other ancient maps, um, they mention that that part of the world is called Nuremberga, uh, which no one's got any idea what it means. It's something that David Hatch Childress picked up on in his book about um, his Lost Cities book about North and Central America. Um, but he kind of got really excited by that name because he believes it has ancient connotations and I, uh, I'm not sure exactly where it might come from but it seems the whole area is called Nuremberg or Nuremberg I can't remember how you pronounce it exactly mm -hmm, yeah. um, but that tower was like the lookout tower but then people have done a lot of tests with that tower and actually found um, that it has astronomical alignments associated with it like sunrises and sunsets as though when you're inside this tower um, you actually look out the window certain windows at certain times of year and it's, it's sort of like a like a mini observatory um, so I think it could have been used as a map making device and also a navigation device for, for sailors when they would they would turn up uh, in that part of America uh, going back a few hundred years but but even today they're not sure who built it or when it was built there's suggestions it was built by um, possibly built by the Sinclair family going back and these are from Scotland you know the, sort of the Masonic kind of right thing. because there is a kind of an Orkney uh, a connection here in terms of the architectural style of the of the tower yeah, I think so. Yeah, I haven't been to the Orkneys myself yet, but I believe um, there's, yeah, what, what I understand about it is that the Sinclair family were in that area, uh, and they actually possibly were the ones who built it because they built a lot of kind of castle-y type things, and you know they were involved in Rosalind Chapel and, and all these other places up in Scotland. Um, but there's evidence going back to about ten or eleven hundred AD. Um, that it could have been built then but there's, there's other people are saying it was there before that uh, and there's evidence of that as well so then who would have done that it could even be prehistoric and, and rebuilt um, again I mean it's just there's just not enough written there's, there's hardly any written evidence and um, there's really not a lot to go on it really is a lot of speculation unfortunately mm -hmm. there, there seems to be a I've always been fascinated with the, with the Orkney uh, connection because to me obviously there's a there's a Scandinavian uh, you know pre pre Viking kind of era of of building and certain monuments that uh, that you found find up all on the on the west coast side of, of Sweden going into Norway and then there seems to be a connection with the Faroe Islands down to Orkney and eventually into Scotland as well and I think it's from here that many of the voyages potentially took place over to uh, Vinland as well or Wineland as the Vikings at that time called it. Uh, because it kind of it, it connects architecturally in one way or another uh, similarities anyway, and I would not be you know I wouldn't doubt at all actually if the you know Sinclair family is involved in some way or another uh, in in at least being a part in the bigger wheel of of those who had this particular architectural uh, style you know it's like a, they they were part of the of the linear lineage of of those who had this knowledge I think anyway. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, with with the Newport Tower in particular, um, I mean, it's not just the Sinclair family who have got connections with that. I mean, the speculations about it are really quite interesting. There's Norse Vikings, obviously. Uh, there's even Chinese origin people. Some research that are put forward as well. Mm. Obviously, the Knights Templar who are kind of connected with the Sinclairs, and then you have the whole voyage of Brendan uh, and the Celtic monks uh, that goes back, you know, just a few hundred A.D. Um, which is this sort of mind-blowing, fascinating story about this Irish monk who travelled on all these crazy adventures, sort of sea monsters, mermaids, and all these amazing kind of stories, and he ended up in potentially in New England and then somehow got home again and to tell his story. Hmm. There's also connections uh, with Portugal as well, which is, which is something I've, I've been um, sort of picking up on. And uh, but others suggest it was actually the people, the later people who built the megalithic chamber it was actually just ancestors of them who were continuing the astronomical knowledge but uh, from a more slightly more modern perspective how about the I mean these the round towers that are all over Ireland kind of carries a, a, sl a slight similarity to, to the Newport Tower as well that's that style and I think it was I don't think it was the Cistercians but it was definitely a kind of a monk order 
which we can connect with, uh, you know, actually going back to, to Templar times as well. What, what do you think, uh, Hugh? Well, yeah, I mean, you, the style, obviously, is very similar uh, if you look at the pictures of them. Um, but with the round towers, they're an anomaly. There's something I've been kind of researching. I went to see a couple of them a few years ago when I was in Ireland. Um, they're very strange. It's almost like they're antennas because um, like, the doors aren't in the right place the doors are too high on them to actually get in them mm-hmm. to get that, and they're all different heights the doors so and then all the base of them is filled up with kind of you know rubble or mud or whatever it's a very chalk or whatever um, as though they're kind of trying to tune them because um, there's no other reason really to do it as far as I could see and then you get the work of Philip Callahan as well who um, actually has done a lot of tests um, he, he was one of the first kind of scientific researchers on the round towers uh, and, and on other megalithic sites as well the pyramids and stuff um, and he actually came up he concluded that they were like antennas for cosmic energy and they would actually fertilise the landscape and bring a charge and energy to that particular landscape and you could even charge seeds and he did this whole whole report on it um, ended up publishing a book about it back in the 70s I think or early 80s uh, which was very inspiring when it came out and because um, he noticed that on a microscopic level lots of um, uh, sort of different types of even bacteria and insects would have these kind of tower shaped kind of antennas and that would be for tuning and like tuning into things and, and so he came up with some fascinating theories and it does seem like the Newport Tower on Rhode Island is actually um, it could be, it looks like it's the same kind of construction style as well when you, when you have a look at it so there might be that Irish connection there, yeah. Could be, could be um, a lot of people a lot of different people are, are obviously travelling Back and forth, it seems like no, no matter what we uh, today, you know, the academic, you know, community, anyways, telling us that that there's a, is a, it happened in a certain way, but that's just you know, it doesn't apply anymore. Basically, there's uh, so many different influences, uh, and and just examining some of these sites suggests that as well. Um, so, yes. is it possible to to get any closer to to the the the, the building of of some of these the megalithic sites in in New England and some of the other places as as well, as well, uh, Hugh. Who, who are we talking about? Do you think? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's a million dollar question. That one, isn't it? I mean, uh, that is that, that is a really that is something. One of the reasons we're going back there because I, you know, you go. I went over there a few years ago, thinking I was going to ask and find the answer. I was going to do this, do that. And and the, the further you look into these mysteries, the more mystery uh, it gets deeper. Um, um, but I get I get a strong suggestion that the earliest sites were possibly of the same megalithic era as some of the sites in Britain, possibly Bronze Age so we're talking, you know, maybe 2000 to 1000 BC mm. um, and because there is actually, you know archaeological evidence and, and carbon dating evidence of some of the chambers going back that far and some of the designs are, are just exactly the same some of the chambers, some of the dolmens are exactly what you get in Europe you get them in different parts of Iberia and through southern Europe and even you know these dolmens for instance they're all around the world I mean they're everywhere they're, they're right over in Korea uh, it's even I even saw a photo of one in Australia uh, a few days ago um, and all the way through the Middle East um, almost every country in the world has these dolmens even down in in, um, in Colombia as well so I'm going to go and have a look at someone I'm down there in uh, November mm-hmm. um, and so you get these these kind of chambers and dolmens seem to be a global phenomenon and so I think you know from what I understand and what I can tell is that was that there was a seafaring race in prehistory there's evidence of that because of the, the sheer quality of mapping that was done that far back and there's proof now that a lot of these maps were several thousand BC possibly even going back to 10,000 years ago because um, there's, there's some evidence of Antarctica being fully mapped before it was covered That's with right. ice. That's it right. must have been that kind of era. So if they were going to map the whole world, they'd have to pretty much go everywhere. And so, therefore, why not New England? You know, why not that part of the, that part of the world? You know, and if you head you know further west into um, America, you get the whole mound culture, which is a whole other phenomenon. You get some mounds uh, occurring down in Virginia, which is kind of south on the east coast south, but further inland really and in and in western New York state um, but mainly down the Mississippi region right up from Ohio all the way down to you know Tennessee right down to Florida 
um, ten, there's over 10,000 recorded mounds there and earthworks and even some of them are very pyramidical you know so um, that, that's a whole other story really that but yeah. I mean it's something I haven't had a chance to look at yet we've got a couple of people coming over to the conference to talk about that Ross Hamilton and Jeffrey Wilson who are coming over from Ohio to discuss their research on, on the mound culture um, I mean I've got to just say this one of the most fascinating thing about the mound culture to me is something that Ross Hamilton has put together. He's got a book called The Tradition of Giants, and uh, he's convinced, and he's got he's got tons of evidence of this. That there's hundreds of reports from the first settlers over there back in the 1600s, um, and they found giant skeletons in hundreds of these mounds, mm -hmm, yeah. with bronze armor with all this strange writing, and, and you know some of them were like 10, 15 feet tall, um, and he's got all this evidence, all these written reports of it, you know, through you know, a 50 to 100 year period, and most of it got squashed by the Smithsonian when they were set up, um, and so there's, the whole, there's a whole other story with that, and this is, this is what Ross Hamilton's going to be discussing at um, our conference in October in New England, so I have to wait, wait till then to hear about that, I <laughs> think. <laughs> well, that's very interesting, uh, giants building it. Uh, it. It would make sense from the point of view of uh, the logistics of it, if you, if you know what I mean, you, considering how, how huge some of these boulders are. I don't know how, how big they would have to be or, or uh, what, what, what size of giants Ross is talking about, but it, there is some, there is something to it. I think there is something there, at least in terms of the the legends and some of the myths that we get from around around the world about uh, giant people, basically. And the question is, are these uh, uh, in some way connected to a much older, you know, type of civilization that was here before, and maybe even some of their knowledge of what they had, you know, was carried on further down. But it's a it's a tricky one with the giants. But it's I feel still that there's uh, there's something there, there's something to it. There's definitely something that I mean. There's so many reports just in North America. I mean, uh, I read his whole book when I was over there last time. It just blew me away. That's why we had to invite him to our conference, really. Um, but you, you get the stuff that Brian Forrester and, and, and David have Childers are doing as well with these elongated skulls. I mean, because they must have been much taller. Just because if you got a skull that long, um, you know, they could have been classed as giants as well. But yeah. it's not just that though. It's, it's almost like there are these lots of different types of humans and this isn't really related to New England I, I should just add in case people are thinking talking about giant and there's not really been discoveries like that there um, but right over on the west the far western side of New York State going into the Mississippi region that's where the discoveries are really made um, but yeah I mean there's like two rows of teeth there's things like that there's um, um, and there's also and some of them had long heads some had very round heads um, there's all these kind of crazy stories. I mean, and there's been some brilliant research um, done over on the western side of New York State, where there's this I can't remember his name, but there's a superb author who's done a book about the, the ancient mounds and the old wars around New York State, and he believes there was like massacres and tribal wars going on for hundreds of years. And this is something actually that. Um, uh, Ross Hamilton's uh, he, he recounted in his book as well to do with the whole Mississippi region. Mm -hmm. Through his research, he realized that there were kind of great wars that took place before, you know, really before the Native Americans, they probably were there at the time, but going back, you know, probably to the, you know, prehistoric times to bronze Neolithic kind well, of age. That's right. I mean, the, the Mississippi culture, I think it's called uh, flat out because they don't know what to name it. And, and there is a, uh, one thing I stumbled over a while back, don't know if you know, know about it, you, uh, Poverty Point. Uh, yes. Very um, interesting. It seems to be actually one of the, Oldest megalithic sites in the in in the world, I think. Yeah, I mean that's down. What, what, what state is that in again? Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, um, the southern states, isn't it? It is. Uh, I think actually it is around Mississippi, so Louisiana. It is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That, that's down the sort of most southern part of um, uh, the Mississippi culture. But yeah, I mean you get like uh, you, you get other sites down in Florida as well, which is uh, around that same kind of age. They're kind of great earthworks with sort of some stonework and a lot of shells they used as well apparently mm. um, uh, and, and they believe that Poverty Point and the ones some of the ones down in Florida are the oldest known sort of ancient constructions in, in America going back to something like 6000 BC or something I understand yeah. um, and so yeah there's I mean there's a lot more to that you know the North American landscape than meets the eye there really is and it's something that you know because when I you know 10 15 years ago I started getting into this megalithic research and this earth energy research it's one of the last places you'll probably think of looking 
you know, you think of going to South America, Egypt, the Middle East, Europe, England, all these kind of places. But once you start getting your, doing a bit of research on them in North America, it's, it's one of the most fascinating places I think I've ever been to. <laughs> and I want to research. Um, and, and I think a lot of people who live in America who aren't obviously a lot of, not native to that land and come from Europe and other parts of the world. But there's such a heritage there, I think, which is really, really important. Um, to you know bring back because um, there's a, you know there's a lot of questions you know because obviously the Native Americans want to keep their land keep their reservations and all this kind of stuff which is absolutely fine and that's the way it should be but there's a whole deeper prehistory there that goes beyond that which that's I think right. I think needs to needs to get opened up a little bit and actually kind of uh, explored and a bit more public with it I mean right yeah, and and I think that's probably like that in, in a lot of parts of the world. But, well, I, th- you know. I think so, Hugh. I mean, if we if we look at it um, at these waves of of different colonization that has happened in in well, I mean, let's face it, most parts of the world, human cultures have have, have migrated and moved and and you know <laughs> walked over each other, and there's been wars and stuff happening. But I think what what happens if we if we look at the, some of the latest waves of these colonizations with a lot of Europeans going over to to the United States or America. Uh, I guess there was a need for for them in one way to obviously cover up the fact that there was people there before, and, and especially even going further back beyond even the Native Americans. You know, that, that's not just the latest battle, if you will, that has happened that has occurred. I think we, we we're talking about many many previous ones before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I, t- I totally agree. I think there's, there's so many levels to, <clears throat> levels to this kind of history. Uh, we, we're kind of, um, we, we, I mean, even like one example which I find really interesting is the the British megaliths, for instance. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't realise this, but the, the the construction of the megalithic sites in England, you know, started so long ago. It's probably the first known ones were probably five thousand BC, possibly even older. You know, obviously there's evidence of these post holes at Stonehenge, ten thousand years ago and things like that mm. it goes from say 5000 BC up to like maybe 1000 BC yeah so that's 4000 years of construction <laughs> a like, lot of time to do a lot yeah, of things exactly and yeah. I think you know we, we, we don't we don't see that when we look at the past and I think this is something I've just been coming around to and realising the, the sort of depth of antiquity and the generational difference and, and cultural differences between even the groups that were living there. I mean, there might have been groups around 2000 BC who harked back to the golden age of 5000 BC or two or 4000 BC or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Uh, we hark back to a golden age of the Bronze Age or the, the Neolithic Age. But even back then when they were still building these sites, they were harking back to a previous golden age so you just don't you know we just don't know you know we, we look at it as like one kind of era but actually it was like you know multiple eras multiple different groups mm. all completely obsessed by big stones and, and building with earth um, a bit like some of us are now but <laughs> that's right well there's another I just want to mention this as well to our, our listeners who uh, ancientcanalbuilders.com very interesting John Jensen has put together some interesting research about uh, you know everything is, is primarily on the east coast on, on the states but even further south with focus I think primarily on Florida, Louisiana, a little bit further up as well but it's a very interesting uh, you know set of, of images and things that he's dug out in terms of evidence for, for canals that has been in America for a long 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 time and then obviously we have a, a sea level issue here which means that we have and as even as John here on the website has pointed out that he, he's showing a lot of sunken harbors uh, okay. because the sea levels have, have actually risen obviously so we, we I think even in in England we have you know Dogger Island and things like that over there we might be having a whole civilization basically on the on the bottom of the floor in some cases as well of the sea Absolutely. I mean, um, this is something that Graham Hancock did in his brilliant book and TV series, Underworld. Um, where, I mean, just around England, uh, Britain, for instance. I mean, there, you know, France and England were joined up. Um, parts of, you know, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of square kilometers, probably millions, in fact, under the sea that haven't been excavated. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so like you say, there's a whole other world we haven't really had a chance to look at yet, and uh, you know, so. I mean that I find particularly interesting. I mean, we need to get our scuba diving kit on to check it all out. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's a it's a it's a lot of stuff that is hidden to us, but uh, where more and more is being discovered, and and again, the more people who are, uh, you know, getting accustomed, uh, familiar with the ideas of megalithic sites, 
I think we'll be able to, in some cases, maybe spot them in their own area, if you will. And again, the, the, we mentioned some of the other websites where people can report their findings, they can begin to you know, document it in one way or another, photograph it, put it on the web, so it's out there for people. And, and, uh, and I think it just adds to this grid work, uh, if you will, Hugh, of megalithic sites and node points that exist all over the globe, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, yeah, it certainly needs to be addressed. And I think it's just you know we, we kind of we have a calling really. I think a lot of us who get into this ancient stuff, these ancient mysteries, we have a sort of calling. It's not just about like finding out the mystery. It's about like finding out who we were back then. You know, because they're, they're all our ancestors, they're our relatives, they're our family. Uh, we're, all, we're all in that, we're all from that bloodline. You know, it's not like they're you know we're, we're distant and you know separate from them. We're all the same people. Um, and the fact it's just the way that history has been sort of suppressed and covered up and lied about to us through schooling and university and television and things. Um, I think a lot of us just like had enough of it and they're going to have direct experience by going to these ancient sites, tuning in, connecting with the ancestors, going to a more shamanic realm perhaps and actually getting results like that. And, you know, and it's like, it's like finding out who we are and I think it, it makes us feel more whole as a human being for when we have that deeper connection um, with these sort of, not just with the ancient sites, but with the, the people who built them uh, going way back. So I think that's something that we've been missing as a culture that, that's just started to come back over the last few decades, perhaps. It was uh, an interesting story that uh, Christopher Knight, who, who I'm sure you're aware of, uh, uh, told to us briefly a little bit about that uh, on the show here a couple of, about a month ago now, maybe a little more, about uh, basically the connection between magnetics and, and, and stone. And he, he retold the story briefly about heating of, of stones to actually realign the the uh, the magnetite or, or the magnetic, you know, you have a you have a an alignment pretty much of the magnetic waves going through the stones once it transforms from being you know lava or whatever it was before, and then it hardens and, and the the magnetic points in the stone, if you will, the magnetite settles. But he talked about a story about reheating the stones to kind of let these loose again, and then having them realign with the current magnetic field, and that this actually had a a physical change, an impact on both his psyche, I think, but also his his body. H have you heard about this at all, Hugh? No, I've never heard about that. That's absolutely fascinating. Because this is one of the, you know, this is, relates to one of the big questions: How do they move the stones? How do they cut them? Now, if you're heating it up, would that? Would, did, did he suggest it was like softening the stone as well? Then I, I, that's what I reckon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting because, I mean, the magne the magnetic side of. Um, these stones is particularly interesting to me. It's some, that's one of the reasons I got into the sites in New England because you, you obviously know the work of John Burke, Seed on Nolly Stone of Plenty. Yeah. Um, he tested loads of the sites around New England um, uh, for like you know magnetic readings, electric charge, cause he, he, lots of orbs were photographed. There was even like going back to some of the sites around New York State, like Balance Rock and Kent Cliffs and others. There's going back. There's a guy called Philip Imbruglio, um, I think his name is, and he. He, he, there was a whole lot of UFO sightings around that part of New York State and lots of the sightings seemed to be like orbs and lights moving through the sky it weren't necessarily nuts and bolts kind of UFOs and what he found was which is kind of blew me away um, is that the lights when, you, when they traced the source of the lights where the lights would go to or come from there was always one of these chambers these megalithic chambers at the source of it hmm. Um, and the, the more he did this and the more tests he carried out he realised they were all built upon lodestone or ma iron magnetic ore there's a whole kind of area strips of it going through the geology uh, in that part of the country um, and then what they did actually built it into the site as well as though they had an understanding of it the effects of it so maybe they were heating it back then for you know for like old oh, states of consciousness to sort of create this different effect for healing purposes uh, and many other things. I mean, um, there's some, been some really brilliant research done on that actually. And obviously, with John Burke, who later um, carried carried out more research from a more scientific perspective, he started doing this thing where he placed seeds inside the chambers or mm -hmm. under the dolmen yeah. at specific times of day when the energy, the telluric energies, were strongest. And then when he planted them, he would get a much stronger yield, larger yield, and uh, often a better quality of crop. Um, and it kind of brought this whole new light to like what these megalithic sites were for. And this is kind of like be, been around for a few years now, but it just fascinates me how these sites still have this power. They still have the energy 
that the ancients either built them for, for that particular purpose, fertility or altered states kind of energy or healing energy, but they still work. And I think that, that, I find that really interesting. How did they know that when they built them? <laughs> or, did, or was it more just chance for that, that they had, they had to build it with massive stone for it to work in a certain way? Because I think the piezoelectrical effect, all the quartz in it as well, yeah. heavy crushing other rocks, things like that. And the sort of acupuncture's, rocks the needles going into the earth um to like bring out the energies so yeah so I, they deliberately did it for future generations which shows a high level of compassion in my opinion or it's just part of the design plan um and i'm interested in, in what chris said about that i have to have a, another listen to that interview absolutely we I, hopefully we could we could uh we're going to talk more in, in in detail about that one but actually you know he, he went through and what he, what he you know suggested but i find the 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 theory there very interesting because to me that means that as you say hugh that the sites still hold uh this the the power if you will the energy that the the resonance if you will of this but at the same time if the magnetics in the stones were realigned, repositioned once again to the current magnetic, you know, because this is, as you know, it's changing all the time, it's moving around, we might even have a, a totally different, different magnetic structures in some of these stones. But if they're realigned, uh, again, through heating up the stones, you, you might have a, a recharging taking place of, of the site, meaning that the power has maybe over the years kind of diminished because this is a tradition that haven't been kept up with, if you will. So ah. if this was to be kind of like you retune the the stones to the magnetic uh, you know poles again, if you will, and hence you have a, a totally different kind of experience. Maybe, maybe that is quite, that's quite plausible actually. Yeah, because this is something that again Burke picked up on in his research. I mean, for instance, he noticed you know at Avebury, like all the stones go around in the great circle, um, all the magnetic norths or and souths were kind of aligned to the next stone as though they were deliberately aligned in that way which suggests that was part of the design and, that, and they kind of had that high understanding of that mm. so what you're suggesting or what Chris is suggesting is that you heat the stone up and you actually you, you, it realigns to the North Pole is that right? that's how I understood it I don't want to speak for him because it, he okay. was you know he was kind of he wasn't that very detailed about it. He just retold, I don't know, you know, all the details of how he heated it up or how much or, or you know, was the stone glowing or was it, was it just like yeah. a little yeah. bit, you know, I'll have to ask him about this. But the basic idea, yes, heating it up, making it in some way having an effect on the stone in terms of the magnetics, and then you have a recharging or whatever you want to call it taking place of the, of the stone or, or the stones that you're doing this to. And um, it could be something... To that actually, because uh, you know, I, I feel there's a lot of ideas that is connected with the with the magnetics. But since this has changed, since the, since the circles and, and other you know sites were built, maybe there is a retuning, if you will, like a like a guitar. You find a guitar that is off, yeah, off yeah. tune, you know, off key basically, but you need to t retune it again for it to sing properly. If you know what I mean. Well, this is like the whole idea of the kind of the grid theory as well in all the earth energies around the planet how they you know if all the sites were retuned as as they were in ancient times it would like the whole world would go into the state of high energy <laughs> that's <laughs> right yeah. an enchantment even you know there's kind of enchant i think there's an enchantment thing we're missing in this culture which i think the ancients uh of this sort of golden age era kind of had and i think that's a lot to do with you know they, they worked uh, maybe the earth was out of balance so they built these sites to actually rebalance the energies of the earth so it was some right. great meteor hits and things like that uh floods and whatever um and so yeah you could, i think that makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense there's something that's popped up in conversation and conferences over the years but yeah i mean i'd like to look into that a bit more because maybe you know individually if people individually go to their local site and do what needs to be done and the whole world would slowly kind of wake up and open up these energies would start you know functioning again and uh, it, could, it could be something that, that actually you know the reason we're, we're starting to realize that now is because it has to be done now um something has to be done i mean this is, this is something about you know that was the great pyramid for instance i mean obviously chris dunn and others have done some fascinating research on that but the fact is now it's like a tourist attraction yeah, uh, yeah. they built all this other rubbish into it that you know this if they actually got rebuilt as to how it was from what they can work out that might that's probably like the main sort of power center that you know got the whole world going <laughs> that's right it seems like it and and it could be i mean i've heard that before as well as an intriguing theory about the 
that the Earth in some way was damaged. There was an, a, a you know meteor struck or, or something happened, which which kind of you know we have the axis, the 23.5 axis on the Earth, and something happened, which makes it made, made it you know a uh, little limp, if you know what I mean, and, and, and that yeah. these sites was a, a healing attempt, an effort to actually restabilize the the magnetics and what have you. And who knows, maybe it's so easy or easy, but so, you know, an, an, an obvious point right now that we are going through more and more earth changes and, 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 and weather patterns which are destabilized because we haven't been keeping up with the work of, of, uh, of utilizing some of these tools and instruments that we have on the planet already to kind of realign them, if you will. Who knows? Yes, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, I think, I think we're on to something there. <laughs> I think there's something that needs to be addressed. And, um, but I mean, th- th- that would explain as well why so many sites were built with such large stones, uh, or, or with earth. They're so big, they're, they're almost impossible to destroy. Yeah. Because they needed to be permanent. You know, they needed to be, you know, be there forever as such. And, um, you know, as the Arab proverb goes, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids. <laughs> That's right, yeah. That, you know, that these are so old. They go, they go beyond our lifetimes, you know, as far as back as we can see. And that's probably a reason for that, perhaps, you know. And, um, yeah, I think, we're, I think we're finding this all out for a reason. Let's uh, keep it in mind and see if it comes up here again. But uh, let's uh, let's round things up here for the first hour, Hugh, and and, and talk about some of your uh, websites. Of course, we, we want to give out some details about. You have in October now. Then you have Megalithomania upcoming in uh, on, on the East Coast in New England, uh, in uh, Connecticut, right? In Glastonbury over there on that side. Uh, That's right. Yeah. And then um, November, you have the tour uh, in Peru with with David. Uh, Ch- Childress and Brian Forrester, but let's talk about the October event first, and then we move on to the Peru tour. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, it's from the 21st and 23rd of October. On the Friday, we've got a three-hour workshop with the brilliant Freddie Silver, um, who's an excellent researcher. He's like from the school of John Michel and um, geomantics and geodetics, and and he's just... Um, I, I met him recently in, in Glastonbury when he was doing some stuff with the Prophets Conference, and he blew me away. I just absolutely love his research we had to get him involved he lives up just in Maine in New England you see so um, but his, his workshops about sacred space and the healing power of resonance uh, and how he believes this is kind of what we were just talking about funnily enough right. Right? Yep. about how these sites need to be back in tune and like we can you know we can go in and we can create this kind of energy field in ourselves and in the sites themselves um, and it's actually it's like a spiritual technology um, and so that's something he's going to look at in the workshop side of things and then we're going to be screening Tor Webster's film The Rainbow Serpent Project um, trying to bring English Glastonbury to American Glastonbury um, and like looking at all the looking at it looks at all the sites around the planet um and I'll be, I'll be talking about a bit about that in the second hour, actually. Um, and we've got obviously people like John Mazer Jenkins, you know, he's been on the show. Uh, Beth Harkins, who's one of the original Earth Grids researchers, who was the biggest inspiration for me to write my little book on Earth Grids. Um, and she's, she rarely does talk, so we, we persuaded her, and she's happy to come now and, and do some talk about the latest in Earth Grids and the mythology of the ancients. We already mentioned Ross Hamilton, um, who's done brilliant stuff around the Ohio landscape, the Serpent Mound, mm. and uh, the Giant and the Mound cultures. Uh, Glenn and Cameron Broughton, I don't know if they've been on the show, but they're like, they live up in Vermont and in Wiltshire. They've got like a double life. Um, but they're like crop circle and sacred sites, sort of tour guides and researchers. Uh, they're old friends of mine as well. Uh, I'll be doing a talk about some of the things we've been discussing today and some new research, uh, which I saved for the conference. Uh, Glenn Kreisberg, He's also speaking at CPAC, and um, he's part of the NERA group. He recently published uh, a book called The Graham Hancock Reader, Mysteries of the Ancients, or Lost Knowledge of the Ancients, rather. Um, And he works with Graham on certain projects. Jeffrey Wilson is one of the top crop circle researchers in America. Uh, And Patrick Cook and Barbara DeLong, they've done this brilliant film called Secrets of the Stones, about the stones around New England. Um, and they've just, they, they've got stuff, they've been on the History Channel, so there aren't, you know, there aren't any, there's not, not a huge amount of big names, but the quality we're really going for with this, we've really kind of talked to all these speakers and we know all their research, um, and so it's going to be a really, really fascinating event. And then obviously we do, um, you know, we do tours as well, we're doing like three days of tours, we're just going to go hardcore with it basically. Um, <laughs> 
on the Monday uh, we're going to go to North Salem New York State we're going to look at the Balanced Rock which is the the to me that is like the on phallus of that whole area it's very powerful dolmen right, yeah. loads of strange stories with that um, yeah a whole report of it was done in John Burke's book we're going to go to other sites in Patterson New York and Kent Cliffs where um, a lot of this re- a lot of Burke and others research was done with a lot of where the UFO sightings were as well on the second day we're going to head up to North New Hampshire which is going to be uh, mainly um, America Stonehenge or Mystery Hill but there's lots of other uh, there's a Druid Hill Stone Circle it's called a place called Brent, a place called Pelham um, and some other chambers the Beehive Chamber near there uh, and then the day three of tours we're just going to go for it basically is um, in down to Connecticut at a place called Gungy Womp um, which is kind of a funny name or Gungy Womp however you want to call it uh, why it's called that I don't know um, but it's possibly a Native American name given to it but this is famous for uh, the, the gravitational and magnetic anomalies there and there's this there's this area it's got chambers in it little stone circles the whole great complex and we've got it's private land but we've got permission to go there that's all been sorted out so people can just relax when they come with us there's, there's no jumping over fences or balacles <laughs> that's good <laughs> yeah um, and um and there's a place in Gunjiwon called the Hill of Tears, which I haven't been to yet. I didn't get to Gunjiwon last time. And this is where a lot of people either, like whenever they go to this particular high energy spot, they break down in tears or have emotional reactions or, or have just a reaction of some sort. But he said, the guy who's kind of works at Gunjiwon, he said he, just, he thought it was a joke originally, but then it, it keeps happening. <laughs> and it has a really powerful effect on people. It has a certain magnetic energy combined probably with earth energies and you know ancestral kind of landscape stuff so that's kind of interesting and there's a few other sites there's the Groton chamber near there uh, which is a very unusual kind of um, chamber which I, oh, I really want to get to um, and a couple of other places we're going to check out on the way back so we're going to be very busy yeah indeed jam-packed schedule obviously there very interesting a great lineup of, of speakers and then you, your guys are heading out on the road as well that's, that's yeah. a lot of fun yeah just doing as much as we can and, and uh, you know we just want to sort of make the most of it really and get everyone involved and have a good time and there's it, it, a new website we've done for it called megalithamerica.com megalithamerica.com that's just one word or they can check out megalithamania.co.uk it's all on there as well um, and I'm personally I mean if people are you know welcome to join me I'm going to be heading over to Ohio for a few days after that so I wanted, I'm desperate to go to the Serpent Mound um, and I'm going to hang, hopefully hang out with Jeffrey Wilson and Ross Hamilton over that way for a few days because they've been making some amazing discoveries out that way which really interests me which um, I really want to check out and they're going to be discussing it at the conference as well so I'm sure it'll whet people's appetite for that you know so um, yeah so yeah we just want to kind of get you know get the megalithomaniacs in America out to play it should be fun excellent uh, megalithamerica.com that's that's a good one <laughs> I like that uh, yeah that's the website where people can go to find out more about that and then obviously the main website uh, as you mentioned megalithomania.co.uk and, and then uh, and, and we're going to focus slightly on some of these things obviously in, in the next hour here with you Hugh uh, about uh, the, the tour obviously in, in Peru we had David Hatcher Childress mm-hmm. and, and Brian Forrester with us talking about this as well but just briefly mention that again because that's in, in November and you, you will be taking along there as well uh, right? Yeah yeah well me Brian and David are kind of organising it uh, it's a megalithomania type thing we're, we're doing 10 day tour uh, Brian's sort of leading it he's got all the know how all the in- entrance to all the sites David Hatcher Children's obviously he's like a legend he's going to be with us um, and we're going to check out all the most amazing sites there around Lake Titicaca Cusco um, Oliantambo Machu Picchu all the, the major sites lots of lesser known sites as well we've got this special ceremony lined up for 11 11 11 at the Stargate at, um, around Lake Titicaca which should be interesting uh, um, and also we've got if people want to stay we're going to Stay, there's an option to stay on for four extra days we're going to do the whole Nazca thing we've got an Ica and all the sites along the west coast it's really hot it'll be really hot over there um, and we're going to go flying over the Nazca lines and things like that so if people want to come to that they can it's an optional extra and uh, we'll all be there for that and um, it's going to be an amazing trip I mean it's filling up fast actually so people you know want to get on it they're going to have to 
get on it quick because <laughs> I'm going to have to lay on a second one. Um, but yeah, I mean I'm, that that as well is absolutely fascinating that part of the world to me, and we'll talk some of that in the next hour, obviously. But um, yeah, especially the, the the great global energy lines, the Rainbow Serpent and the Plume Serpent energy lines that meet at this particular area on the island of the Sun in Lake Titicaca. Which I discovered when I was there last time, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to going back there with a group and kind of checking out all these amazing energies. Absolutely, all right, a lot, lot of fun. Obviously, a lot of uh, things coming up on the on the planner, as it were. Uh, any other website you want to mention now, Hugh, before we proceed in the second hour for our members? Yeah, I mean, there's avalonrising.co.uk. That's just something we do locally down in Somerset as project, Earth Mysteries kind of project. Um, and we kind of film all our, we do a lot of talks at festivals. We cover lots of different subjects, a bit like you do on Red Ice, really. Uh, the Lawful Rebellion stuff, Earth Mysteries stuff, Consciousness Changing 2012, all that kind of subjects. And just a sort of loose network of researchers and free thinkers who are kind of work together and just put our stuff up on that website really um, there's also my other website psychicchildren.co.uk and some earlier research I did about 8 or 10 years ago uh, I got a book out about that um, about the indigo kids and, and that, that whole phenomena which is fascinating as well newhuman.co.uk is my nutritional uh, stuff I've been doing uh, sort of business from a business sense which is something uh, um, I've studied as well um, which is starting now to fit into some of this megalithic stuff but maybe we'll, we'll talk about that later um, yeah and I'm currently writing a book about these sites around near Cambridge in England called Wandleberry um, and the locks of Rome alignment and all the stones and ley lines and earth mysteries all around here because it's kind of where I'm from really and um, it's kind of where I am now actually doing a bit of research and writing so I want to get that book out as soon as possible and then move on to more sort of global um, books about you know stuff going on all around the world Excellent, uh, lots of link, obvious links for you guys to check out as well we'll have them up on RedEyesCreations.com for ease in case you didn't have a, a pen and uh, catching all that. But again, the main website is uh, megalithomania.co.uk for the tours and all of this as well. And then obviously check out uh, newhuman.co.uk. Excellent. Thank you very much, Hugh. Stay with us here and we'll carry on in the next segment. In the next hour, we continue to discuss global earth energies, the chakra points of the planet and Lake Titicaca with Hugh Newman. There are only two places on the planet where the rainbow serpent and plumed serpent energy lines meet, and one of these is allegedly in Lake Titicaca, the other one is at the Four Mountains in Bali. We talk about energy lines going through major cities, and other sites or locations that have been taken over to choke up the energy flow of the planet. RedEyesCreations.com is the website. All information on how to subscribe and get access to our members area is available on the website. It's very easy. Sign up for a three-month subscription. Try it out. You can stream or download all our content going back to 2006. Coming up on Red Ice Radio, we have Kevin Annette, Marsha Schaefer, Bob Dean, Judy Wood, Penny Pierce, John Coleman, Robert Bovall, Ken Thomas, Rosalind Peterson, Carl Johan Kalaman, and Frank O. Collins, to name a few. Stay tuned to Red Eyes Radio as we continue to bring you new programs and updates on the most interesting and important topics. Stay with us. Our two with you is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> 